Welcome back to another episode of the Keep Going Podcast with Vin Kennedy. I'm your host, Vin Kennedy, and today we have a, uh, a special guest. This is Jeff Cunningham. And uh, Jeff, you want to do a quick little uh, little intro about yourself? Yeah, my name's Jeff Cunningham. I, among other people, coach Vince. I am an attorney by trade, but I coach um, half marathon, marathon, distance runners in general. I ran my collegiate track and field at Baylor University uh, back before the invention of indoor plumbing and the wheel. And I uh, segued into coaching high school runners and then eventually post-collegiate runners. And now I coach a lot of people all over the U.S. and the world doing a whole bunch of amazing things. And I really love it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, the just the structure and schedule that you put in place is it's awesome. And it makes I could see how people that don't love running could fall in love with it just from working with you. It's just the way you plan everything out really does. It just makes it easy. Well, you know, I think that um, a lot of people have sort of an ambivalent relationship with running because your experience with it was that it was used as punishment in high school. Um, you know, you drop a baseball, you're going to go and run from foul pole to foul pole. You're going to fumble. Um, you're going to do air raids. You're going to run. You got guys showing up late to practice at basketball. Everybody's going to run lines. And so the problem is, is running is used as punishment. And it doesn't have to be punishment. I mean, there's a way to do it where it's sustainable. There's a way to do it where it's enjoyable. There's a way to do it um, long after your knees and your hips and everything and your, and, and your shoulders aren't going to allow you to slide into second base, throw 90 mile an hour heaters and, uh, and, and, and dunk basketballs, you know? So that, that's the one thing, too. I guess the, there's longevity in it where you you might not think. Obviously, you can't play football your whole life, but, you know, yeah. most likely you could you could get some miles in when your football career is over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's a reason why thousands of people participate in everything from um, the little local turkey trot to the New York Marathon and everything on the continuum of running in between. It's a lifelong sport that can be done pure recreationally, semi-competitively or competitive at the highest level. And I coach all levels right now and it's incredibly fulfilling. I love it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And quite the career. So yeah, that's kind of what I want to touch on was your your running career as a whole, how you got into it, what made you fall yeah. in love with it? Yeah, well, you know, I was introduced to running when I was just a young kid, and I actually found out I was pretty good at it. So uh, I want to say it was 1985 or six, actually, when I was 11 years old, I actually quit baseball and uh, ended up taking up the sport pretty seriously, even at a pretty young age. Um, ended up running well in high school, signed a scholarship with Baylor University, went and ran for Baylor, went to law school, actually, uh, when I graduated from Baylor, ran some of my best times at various distances, all the way from 5K um, to the marathon. In fact, I per ran all my personal bests, actually, when I was in law school. Um, and then I sort of segued into high school coaching and then um, took up coaching the marathon in 2018 when one of my ex-runners who had already finished her collegiate career uh, was back in Austin. And um, now it's ballooned into what it is I do now. And I've coached everybody from people in the U.S. Olympic trials um, all the way to people just basically doing a couch to marathon program and everything in between. Yeah. And, and so I think that's funny that you noted that. So while you were in law school, you actually hit most of your PRs. Do you have were you athletically at just a, an advanced age, you think? What do you think you could kind of attribute that to? Yeah, good question. I was engaged in such structure. I was studying so much that I didn't have a lot of time for all of the jackassery that goes into being an undergrad, right? I was really, really intentional with my training. I hit my spots very carefully. Uh, when I had a workout that was on the schedule, I showed up ready for it and I nailed it. And I didn't do a ton of workouts. I was very purposeful in the way I did my volume and um, I raced pretty sparingly. And so I actually ran my personal best in the 5,000 meter 5k when I was in law school and then ran the fastest five mile race I ever ran when I was in law school, you know, and it was really interesting because I learned a lot about myself and I took a lot of the pieces of what worked really well from high school I took a lot of what I was really good at and worked well in college. And then I was able to sort of do the workouts on my own schedule. If I didn't feel great one day, I might push it to another day. So the, the built-in flexibility, I think, allowed me to sort of maximize uh, the benefits 
um, aerobically and otherwise of the workouts when uh, my training wasn't prone to arbitrary rigidity, uh, doing lots of workouts on tired legs, uh, the things that sort of befall, I think a lot of collegiate runners where um, the whole structure uh, of the way the seasons are stacked across country in the fall then you go straight into indoor track in the winter. Then you go straight from indoor track to outdoor track. Um, there's almost no period in the year when you're running collegiate track and field and cross country where you're not actually in racing season, right? Right, right. yeah. It even came with even more roadblocks. It's sort of funny when you live in the state of Texas because the only uh, time of year when you're not racing is from about uh, uh, the beginning of June to the end of August, when the average high temperature is between 97 and 102 degrees in Crazy. Texas, in Central Texas. Uh, so the only time when you're not racing is when it's impossible to even run when you're just running easy. Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> so I mean, it's pretty tough. Yeah. Well, and then even so, obviously, you touched on it briefly. So like almost going slower to go faster. And I've heard you say that before. And yeah. I think that's that's something that personally working with you, I'm learning and, and implementing and it's, it's helping me out tremendously. But if you want to, if you want to kind of go into detail on your, your mottos with that. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you ever seen, uh, those Staples commercials on TV where they, uh, are in the, uh, uh, uh the operating room or doing something. Right. And there's mm -hmm. that big red button that says easy on it. You just right. hit the easy button. Right. Yeah. That was easy. To some degree, I think that we all need to accept that it's possible to get better by running easier on most days, right? We live in a society where embrace the grind, right? Uh, get 1% better every day is somewhat misinterpreted, right? Um, if we are going to believe in getting 1% better every day, right? Um, so what we believe is that our progress should be linear and we should get better every day. And the only way we get better every day is by this uncompromising marriage to the self-infliction of discomfort. Um, and I think it's an admirable uh, 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 pursuit on some level because it sort of um, epitomizes what I believe one of the great American attributes is our toughness. We're tough. Right. And we enjoy um, uh, uh, the self-infliction of discomfort. At least a lot of people do. Right. And there's a place for that, but possibly not in distance running. Right. And I say possibly and I'm really trending toward absolutely not. Right. Yeah. Um, um, the way we should do it. Um, run easy. Uh, the human aerobic system is a fascinating system. That's the same one that we had 200 years ago, 300 years ago. I would offer 500 years ago, right? Listen, I tell a lot of people, the reason why we don't die from an abscess tooth, right? Or most of the time we don't die from things like staph infections, right? Right. It's because we discovered something called penicillin, right? Um, so we live to the ripe old age of 75, 80, 85 now. But our actual aerobic system, the way we deliver oxygenated blood, working muscles is the same one we had when Roger Bannister broke four minutes in the mile for the first time, right, in the 1950s. It's the same oxygen delivery system that Pheidippides had when he died running the first marathon, right, in Greece back in uh, 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 eons ago, right? So we can't rush the process, but we live in a world where uh, Vincent Kennedy can have Jeff Cunningham on a podcast from 1,500 miles away via Zoom. And how did you get me the information to log onto the Zoom? Instagram, instant messaging. We have drive through liquor stores in the state of Texas because we're too lazy to get out of our damn trucks to go buy whiskey, right? But the problem is the oxygen delivery system that we have is the same one we had a thousand years ago. But what we wanna do is we wanna rush that process. How do we try to rush the process? run hard every day. I'm going to get better every day. I'm going to go on and run hard every day. We get tired. We get injured. And, you know, Vincent, um, you're not an old guy, but you've lived enough to know that life is about sustainability. How is any endeavor that we're engaged in that's meaningful to us going to be sustainable if we dislike it every day? Think about that. Yeah. Right?
Absolutely. The only thing that's sustainable that we dislike every single day is imprisonment. Why? Because we can't get out because we don't have the keys, right? But why should we be held prisoner by our jobs? Why should we be held prisoner by our athletic pursuits, whether it's running or what have you? And the answer is we don't. We will just quit them if there is no sustainability in it, if there's no enjoyment. And so what we tend to do is take a sport that was once viewed as punishment and continue to punish ourselves by running too hard every day. And then we compound the problem because the ultimate punishment is working hard at something and seeing no progress. Absolutely. So we work hard every day. We make it hurt every day. And we're like, I don't know why I'm not getting better. And the answer is so painfully, yet not painfully in reality, clear, which is let's slow down. Let's actually run slow enough to where we actually notice the sunset if we're out running in the morning, uh, sunrise, excuse me, sunset in the evening, right? Slow down. Let the aerobic process begin, the aerobic development begin, what we call aerobic adaptations. Let your body make the progress it will make in its own time. And let's take months to do it. And let's not take our Instagram drive through liquor store. I want it now artificially induced ADD get in the way of mother nature's natural process if we can just let it play out yeah That's no absolutely yeah. yeah I mean you said it perfect and so probably I would say two years ago I really started to dive into like endurance type of events and right with no proper training no no scheduling no idea on how to do it so right. to run a marathon to me it was you know I gotta run a half marathon this week I gotta run 16 miles I gotta run 17 miles I think I ran like 22 and then I was like, all right, next week. Now we're just running it. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I barely built up to it. And I was just, I was sitting there and I, I'm at a place now where I hate to compare people and things because we're all in different lanes. That's mm. how I feel personally. And I was like sitting around and I'm looking around of like, you know, people post on Instagram that they ran a marathon and, you know, you see like an, an older gentleman or an older lady. And I'm like, how could they have sustained that? And like, I was like, you know, I like to think I'm in decent shape. And I was like, and I'm like dead. I was like, I ran that marathon. It was like, I think a little over, it was just around four hours. And right. I would absolutely guess. I was like, how do these people do this and like enjoy it? But it makes yeah. complete sense. It's because they're going about it in a much more strategic way. Right. It's an investment in process. It's an understanding that it's a high volume endeavor. And right. so if we also take it easier most days and we can get into, you know, what the days look like that aren't easy by right. design, right? But most days need to be easy running. But if you run easier, it stands to reason then you can run more, right? And when you're out doing a 26-mile race, volume is a component to the training that is an inescapable reality that we need to get done. The benefits of running slowly are that it allows for the aerobic adaptations to take place in a natural way where we will progress in almost a counterintuitive fashion. But then we can also just run more volume. Right. And the more volume you can handle, um, the better off you're going to be because – Marathons are hard, man. I think that goes without saying. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, and I, I've heard you talk about that as well, where it's just, it's one of those distances where you obviously you can't be foot on the gas the whole time, but no. for certain time, like, you know, times you want to hit, you can't ease up either. So it, it's that middle ground. Um, and it's just, yeah. it's, it's tough. And, uh, and something else that you've, you've, you've been quoted saying, and I love it is uh, consistently good over occasionally great. I think mm -hmm. it also goes in line with what you've been saying. If, if you want to just touch on that, because I think that is so powerful. And, and like you said, in this quick instant gratification world, it's things like that are so overlooked. Right. And, you know, I think that we get into a lot of cliche and a lot of sayings that people like to proclaim as being metaphors for life. But I think being consistently good rather than just occasionally great is something that's really applicable in almost every area of life. Be a consistently good parent. Don't just be the hero who shows up with a brand new toy every once in a while, but then it's just absent the other six days of the week, right. right? Be consistently good at your job. Don't show up fired up on 36 ounces of black coffee at 5 a.m. one day, but then show up late the other four days of the work week, right? Just consistently be there, be good. So when we apply it to running, um, what I find is um, we have people who often will start out fired up. I mean, just going out there and just tearing ass, you know, for 
a few days a week for a few weeks and then it becomes a day a week and then it becomes done, right? And then it was, or I ran that workout so hard, I couldn't even come back and I couldn't run the next day or the day after that. Rolling around on the ground with blood squirting out the corners of our eyes one day, but then too sore to run for two days after that. Guys, how about we just moderate our effort? Just be really solid that day and then show up the next day and just be consistently good the next day and then consistently good the next day. Never, you know, you're never going to have just, you know, this, this rapturous day, you know, we're not always going to have jet fuel shooting out of our ass. Let's just show up and just be solid every day. And then you're going to wake up six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 16 weeks later, and you could have had a transformative experience had you just shown up just when the alarm goes off roll sideways put both feet on the floor and take a brief deep breath and say all right let's go yeah and just do it every day yeah absolutely and i think even to the last point there i feel like a lot of even just working out in general to people is just getting out the door getting in the gym putting the shoes on because when you get in the flow of it it it, it not easy but sometimes it's enjoyable you know not every run is enjoyable but there are no. times where, you know, you hit that, you know, you kind of hit that, that zone where it's just mm -hmm. feels mm -hmm. good. Well, you know, what's also enjoyable is the feeling of um, accomplishment, the feeling of, wow, I did something when I didn't want to do it. The after effects are enjoyable too. And so I always tell people when they say, well, I don't want to work out. What I tell them is think about how proud of yourself you're going to be when you're done today right. and how proud of you self that you're going to be that you put both feet on the floor stood up took a deep breath tied your shoes and went out the door being consistently good is literally the holy grail for endurance sports you can go out and you can finish basketball season all right and you can go and not pick up a basketball for 14 days and i guarantee you you're going to be able to dribble down the court make a layup, okay? You take 15 days off of running where you literally sit on your ass and do nothing. And that first day that you come back having done anything, that ain't gonna be a layup, man, no. yeah. right? Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna, you, you're gonna, gonna have a little rust in the tailpipes, right? Absolutely. And so what I tell people is when we're dealing with consistency in the endurance space, Let's try to limit our time off to structured time off rather than time off that wasn't built in because we drank 10 too many beers the night before right. or because it was too inconvenient because we had to be somewhere at nine and we over prioritized the extra 30 minutes of sleep when we would feel a lot better about ourselves if we had just gotten up and run. Right. Listen, uh, the reality is we have what's called mitochondrial density. And the mitochondria, going back to our, our biology, our AP biology days in high school, and if some of us was actually brave enough to take a biology class in college, I wouldn't, because I wouldn't brighten up, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, mitochondria is the little engine that makes the cell go, right? What we know is that through moderately applied aerobic distress that's consistent, you will increase, you will build what's called mitochondrial density. You can take a guy that's exactly your height, a guy that's exactly your weight and you guys can stand side by side and one of you who's been running five days a week for four months straight and the other one who's been running once a week for four months straight you go into a biopsy of your muscle one of you's going to have probably twice the mitochondrial density why does that matter it means you can run faster and you can run farther without falling apart now, we've also studied the fact that mitochondria have like a seven to eight day sort of shelf life, so to speak, before they actually start um, withering away and dying out. Why? Because your body says, well, Vincent doesn't need these. He doesn't run anymore. Why do we need these? Right? Okay. It's kind of like in arid climates. Why do uh, plants and trees shoot their roots so deep? Well, it's reactive to what's going on around it, and they go in search of water right? Well, your body uh, only builds mitochondria and actually um, builds 
uh, uh, distal capillaries, we call it distal capillarization in response to the aerobic stress that we put on our body. And when we say I'm quote out of shape, what we typically mean is that our distal capillarization, our mitochondrial density is not where it was because we took three months off of running and we have to rebuild that right? So if you were in a constant state of building, tearing down, building, tearing down, what happens is, is you just climb back up to the same landing on the stairwell, and then you just go right back down, and you spend your whole time here, and you're like, well, why are they getting better? Because they were consistently good, and you weren't. Right. Tough business, man, but this is the way it goes, right? You're you're in the business with, with the coaching, running yourself, and, and you know it's just it's one of those things that I feel like just makes you a better person because you're doing such a tough task. Like you could lift in the gym. You could, you know, even play basketball, you know, they blow the whistle, you get a breather. Running is one of those things where your legs are constantly moving. Of course you could go at so slower speeds, but it's just taxing because it's, it's consistency. And it's a lot of people quit yeah. in their minds way before, you know, their bodies will. And it's just that you kind of have to have that extra push. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, the other thing, too, is people quit before um, they let themselves become what I refer to as running adept. What does running adept mean? It means that you transition from it being drudgery at the beginning, right, to something where it's actually enjoyable in most cases pretty easy on a day-to-day -day basis to the point where you actually thrive on it and you look forward to it. You become running adept when you can go out and run four, five, six miles at a time and you feel possibly invigorated, possibly even less tired at the end of the run than you did at the beginning when you just felt cranky and achy and in a bad mood because you had, you know, three really annoying afternoon conference calls and you sat in a cramped office all day, blah, blah, blah right? You feel invigorated at the end. But when it gets to the point where running is fairly easy, it gets to the point where it's enjoyable, you start looking forward to it. That's what I mean by achieving a place um, that I would call being running adept. And when we get to that point, then you can actually train rather than just sort of slog through your days. And then when you start training, then you see massive improvement. And then you can start attacking goals. You can start looking at time-based uh, uh, um, endeavors where you're like, I want to run that time in that race. And it just becomes a progressive thing. But you got to be consistent early and be patient. And you will begin to start stacking all these bricks towards becoming really running adept. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and like you said, yeah. like you see the accomplishments and you build a, a belief in accountability in yourself. And then right. obviously it gets easier and almost for, for me personally, and I know some people hate running, but more enjoyable. It really does. Yeah. For most almost everybody can almost everybody can enjoy running. Yeah. Right. It's a bit of an acquired taste. But a lot of people who say, well, I'm not a runner. A lot of times I ask them, well, how hard have you worked at running? Well, I really haven't. Well, then I would agree with you. You're probably not a runner. Um, the most talented guy in the world who doesn't actually train and doesn't run running's not going to be super enjoyable and not be super easy. You got to give it a chance, man. And it's really tough because we live in a world where sometimes there may not be as much stick to as there um, could be and possibly should be, right? And uh, people um, sometimes flip from one thing to the next without really giving a good go. You got to give it a good go. You got to give yourself a chance. And we go back to allowing Mother Nature uh, uh, to sort of um, allow the aerobic system to progress at its own pace. And you just can't force the issue. Yeah. Sure. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, something that I kind of wanted to really talk about was like just your coaching career as a whole, like right. some of your proudest moments. And then just mm. kind of, you, you said you segued into um, marathons after you were dealing with one of you i believe you said high school or a post-collegiate runner post -collegiate who runner. i i had i had coached in high school and then went off to college and came back well i you know i got into coaching um high schoolers in the early 2000s and then i ended up um 
uh, coaching at St. Michael's Catholic Academy in Austin, Texas, uh, where my wife was the head track coach, actually. Ended up becoming actually the athletic director at the high school eventually. I just really, really enjoy the process of taking somebody who was not particularly good or not particularly great and then turning them into good runners, right? Had some state champions, had some national qualifiers in high school, um, sent, you know, um, a lot of kids on to run collegiately, right? And it was really enjoyable, you know, to fly to Atlanta and go to a Georgia Tech track meet and watch this young lady run, right? Or uh, fly to the NCAA championships and watch uh, a couple of my ex-pupils um, run, right, for uh, various schools are at, whether it's University of Colorado, University of Tulsa, um, University of Texas. It was just a lot of fun. Right. Um, and then as I got older, uh, uh, these young people started graduating from college, right? And then uh, one runner uh, contacted me and uh, ran a marathon, and um, she um, actually ran her marathon debut and ran 233, believe it or not. Um, and uh, finished uh, in the top 10, actually, at a, a Houston Marathon. And so then it sort of just blossomed there. And I'd already run eight marathons, right, wow, before yeah. this. And so I had an inkling of sort of what it was all about. And I took all of the history and all of the um, knowledge that I had gained, um, not just from on-the-job training, but from talking to people who knew a lot more about this than I did when I was young, Heather Burroughs right, at uh, University of Colorado, which is really funny because I used to race her brother at the Junior Olympics back in 1986 and 1988 when right. we were just kids, right? Now she's obviously, she's been a longtime coach at University of Colorado, right? Pat Tyson at Gonzaga, for instance, right? Um, he uh, ran with Steve Prefontaine back at University of Oregon is a friend of mine. Um, you know, and then some of the great coaches in the state of Texas are all mentors to me, right? And uh, Steve Gully at University of Tulsa, uh, who's coached multiple NCAA champions and collegiate record holders, who was my coach when I was at Baylor. These are the guys that you pick the brains of. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, man. Um, go to people that know more about you, uh, more, well, <laughs> might know more about you too. Uh, coach Gully has some stories to tell, uh, but <laughs> no more than you. Right. And be willing to say, I need some advice here on that. And that's kind of the space that I got in when I was coaching. Apply all of that. And then, you know, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, 2020 um, had a couple of runners in the U.S. Olympic trials in the marathon. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. And um, that is an incredibly rewarding experience when you have somebody literally crying tears of joy when they call you and say coach I did it or cross the finish line and tears of joy when you're standing there at the race and said coach I did it whether it's just finishing a marathon whether it's qualifying for the U.S. Olympic trials when I was in high school qualifying you know coach uh, when I was coaching in high school when they uh, you know, qualifying for the national championships, right? And cross country. I mean, those are the things that you take with you, taking pride in other people's joy, taking pride in the gift that they give me as a coach, right? People say, well, you gave me the gift of coaching. Thank you. And my response to them is, no, thank you. Thank you for trusting me. And thank you for giving me this memory of watching you being so eternally satisfied and happy with yourself it just feels great it yeah. really does oh that's that's awesome and and so obviously you know decorated people you've worked with and obviously you could you could tell the level of care you have and i, I noticed that from the first phone call you're you're just your energy and you could you know you could tell when people are bullshit and when people aren't and the level <laughs> of care it seems like you have with every athlete is just it's awesome and it's, it's really what separates you and it shows, obviously, you know, your, your athletes give you 100% because of that. But with that, what do you think is something specifically that all of these people that crush their goals have in common or these high level athletes? Have you found a couple things that they all do, especially obviously when it comes to running or, or not? They prioritize it. Right. Right. You can't treat your running like dragging trash bags out to the curb and just hope that it's going to be great. Right. Um, I tell people that I'm a good coach, but I, I'm, I'm not a magician, okay? 
I don't have a, 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 a big bag of pixie dust in my cupboard that I pull out and sprinkle on everybody's head. And then suddenly they can just go run six flat a mile for 26 miles. Right. Right. Um, so what I find is people prioritize it. People are consistent with it. Right. And they are um, adept at looking long term and have the concept of delayed gratification as sort of central to their own process, right? Um, listen, man, imagine if you were the president of the construction company that built the pyramids in Egypt. And if it took that long to build those damn things today, you'd be fired in a heartbeat, right? Yes, we sir. have no patience. Um, delayed gratification is something that has been short-circuited and it is a quintessentially human trait. Think about it. Think about our ability to invest in 401ks long-term and understand this is a 40-year process. Think about uh, uh, anything that's meaningful that we've ever achieved. Uh, we didn't stumble into it and get it done in five minutes. Okay, listen, fine. We all have the story about the lottery winner, right? But let right. me ask you this. Um, is winning the lottery an actual retirement plan? No, it's right. not, is it? Right? right? And so what I always tell people is don't, if hope is a significant part of your plan, and I said this when I was talking to somebody else a few weeks ago, you might not have a great plan. You might want to try to get a different one, right? So the really good runners I've coached, um, um, belief in themselves, the elimination of hope as a large part of the plan, investing in the concept of delayed gratification and knowing that we're looking at a six, seven, eight, ten, sometimes two, three year process and prioritizing the goal. You got to make it a priority. OK, you can only have three real priorities in your life, being a really, really great family member, whether it's spouse or dad, we'll call that a priority, prioritizing mm -hmm. your family and your relationships that are central to your life, okay? Mm -hmm. Prioritize your career in a healthy way, but you've got to make it a priority, right? And then you can have one other priority in your life that um, needs to be bodybuilding, needs to be running, it needs to be motocross, it needs right. to be basket weaving, whatever it is, okay? One other. Beyond that, I don't know that we have the bandwidth. I sure. really don't. Yeah. We're um, getting ourselves too thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And once you spread yourself too thin, you know, you try to stand on that ass, you're going to fall right damn through it, aren't you? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. So what's your proudest moment as a coach? Wow. You know, that's a really difficult question. And I'm not trying to just sort of be, you know, sort of politically correct to like protect the feelings of my runners who might watch this. Um, you know, as a coach um, years ago, um, I had a young runner who was a freshman in high school told me that he wanted to achieve X, Y, and Z. Right. And, and I just said, wow, man, you know, that's a, pretty audacious goal right um uh, it was a you know a goal to run a time that would have put him in the top 10 um all time in the state of texas in the two mile right oh, wow. and you know and it wanted to qualify for the national championships right and nobody in our uh, classification in our division in the state of texas had ever done that uh in the history of ever um, and then there we sat, you know, in 2009, and lo and behold, he achieved all of that. He ended up running 902 for two miles and uh, qualified for the Nike National Championships in cross country, and, you know, ran under 15 minutes for 5K on a cross country course. This is really tough, right? He was only 17 years old when he did that, right? You know, but here's a young guy who didn't have the most talent, Uh but the concepts of delayed gratification and consistency um, were there even at the age of 15, 16 for this young guy. You know, I had another young woman who said, I, I want to run for the University of Texas. And I tell this story a lot and she always gets a kick out of it because now she's just an old woman, right? Um, I'm kidding. She's 30. <laughs> Calm down, everybody. Um, uh, uh, um, 
you know, and she said, I want to run for the University of Texas, you know, and I kind of had that Rudy moment, you know, where the priest put his hand on Rudy's shoulder and said, Notre Dame's not for everybody, you know, <laughs> I says, listen, man, I mean, there's a whole lot of schools out there. I mean, running for the University of Texas, you, you got to, you know, you got to you got some talent. You got to be fast. She says, right. well, I'm quitting running if I don't do that, if I don't accomplish that. It's where my dad went. That's what I want to do. I said, okay, you know, and then lo and behold, you know, it's a really good thing to be stubborn, by the way. I think being stubborn has gotten a really bad rap. Being stubborn, <laughs> um, if you apply your stubbornness in, uh, 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 in, in good areas and you channel it properly, it's actually not a bad thing. And uh, that was one stubborn kid, you know, and uh, I, I, October, you know, uh, 2010, late October, I get the phone call that she had, you know, um, earned herself a spot and actually got a, a scholarship offer, right? And accepted it and went and ran at the University of Texas. We I mean, those moments, those kinds of moments just make you incredibly proud because these are, you know, kids who weren't the most talented I ever coached, right? Um, and they went on and ran uh, in Division I uh, track and field and had nice careers and uh, are out doing great things as young adults now. You know, in the post-collegiate realm, you know, it's uh, coaching folks who've gone, who've gone from nothing to something, you know. I mean, I've had people go and, you know, get 30-minute, you know, marathon PRs and, you know, people run, you know, a minute faster, uh, at the age of 23 or 24 than they did uh, running collegiately at the division one level. All those moments make me proud and it's hard to just pick out one, but you know, um, I've got people who have positioned themselves now to have a legitimate chance to try to do something crazy like qualify for the U.S. Olympic trials when uh, two years ago, their running career was either non-existent or on the verge of death. And they've resurrected themselves through consistently applied effort and um, a little bit of stubbornness and, um, and prioritization. Suddenly, we're sitting here in 2022. Um, the window to qualify for the trial shuts down, I think, in January 2024. So we've got about 18 months, right, to get it done. And I'm seeing some progress here. Those things make me proud to see people who are really fine people. They have careers too now. We're not talking about professional runners. Right. right? We're talking about people who are journalists. We're talking about people who are uh, uh, PhD students. We're talking about people who are working in the tech industry who happen to be super talented and driven in this other area of their life. And so they've prioritized two of the three, right? right. Um, that I just talked about was they're good at their careers or PhD student, uh, uh, um, but getting it done running as well. Yeah, no, that's yeah. awesome. And, and with the stubbornness, I feel it kind of goes hand in hand with self-belief and it's, it's gotta be inspiring for you to yeah. see, to see all that come to fruition. And obviously it's very rewarding on the coaching end, end as well. Yeah. So. It's really interesting that you say that I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but, um, self-belief and stubbornness are not always differentiable, are they? Right. Right. No, it's true. Um, right. And, you know, and some people say, man, that guy's got no let up. I mean, that guy never quits. Um, yeah, well, he's stubborn because he is driven by his own self-belief. Right. right. Listen, if we don't believe in ourselves, nobody else can. And I always told the teams that I coach and I tell everybody now. If the coach wants it more than you want it, it's never going to work. You have to be driven by your own self-belief. You have to be driven by your own intrinsic desire to accomplish something. And then I can motivate, I can cheer, I can cajole, I can uh, craft these workouts, and we're going to get there together in collaborative fashion. But it must start with your self-belief. Without that, you're just a shell of a human. You may as well be a robot walking down the street because with self-belief comes soul. With soul comes passion. With passion comes achievement. Yeah. No, What's the last so passionless person you saw go and be really damn good at something? I mean, really, really fine at something. Okay, fine. I'm sure there's going to be somebody that's going to watch. So, well, I know this one guy. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows the one guy. I'm not talking about the statistical outliers. But, I mean, generally speaking, Vincent, what is the last person you saw who was just incredibly good at what they were doing? Music, art, athletics? who wasn't passionate about it. No, it's true. Yeah, you need that level of care. You really do. You better. And yeah, no, it's true. 
And obviously yeah. just, just hearing you speak and it's something that always, like whenever I think of you, I just think of like great positive energy. And like, what do you think your energy source is? Like, where does that come from? Investment in other people, seeking joy in other people's successes, not viewing other people's successes is somehow a cut at you. It's somehow stealing your thunder, right? But even more so is having this meaningful collaborative effort with every person who I've ever mentored, every person who I've ever coached, where um, there is a sense of pride for me too. I guess on some level, we like to speak in a lot of cliche where we say, you know, it's always 100% about other people. And I suppose that's not entirely correct because if it were, why do we have coach of the year awards? Right. Right. Absolutely. You don't think that great coaches don't make it about them a little bit? Listen, man, on some level, when one of my runners wins, I feel like I've won. Why? Because it was confirmatory evidence that the work that we put in collaboratively um, was good, that we had our oars in the water and we were both headed in the right direction. So I do make it a little bit about myself, but not in the selfish sense, but just taking pride in a job well done, taking pride in the sense that we collaboratively went, chased a goal and got it. But at the end of the day, it really has to come intrinsically from the athlete. And I get an incredible amount of joy when I see people accomplish a goal, do something that they thought maybe was not um, within a realm of possibility, um, but then go out and do it. And I just get incredibly fired up watching other people do previously unthinkable things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you go into it too with like this we aspect, which is great. And I think actually really helps a lot of people that look at running as like a daunting task or a marathon as this big, scary, you know, almost mm. project in a sense. And you make yes. it a we thing and you're there that the athlete isn't alone and you're kind of there to guide them and help them. And I think that really helps. It's my goal to equip you with the tools to handle the rigors of the race. Right. Um, are we handling our hydration and our nutrition on race day properly do we have a sound plan do we have a sound grasp on exactly what our physical capabilities are what our fitness is and what is the goal do we have a grasp for 16 weeks 14 12 10 8 6 weeks out on how this plan is getting me to progress toward the goal um what if I had a bad workout? Is everything doomed? Hey, what do I need to do here and there? So it has to be collaborative. And I believe that if you buttress somebody, you put scaffolding around your athletes, you put scaffolding around anybody who you're trying to advise or coach in any sphere, whether it's in the finance industry, whether it's, uh, you know, if you are a music teacher or if you're a running coach, put scaffolding around your mentees. And then that way, they're always supported and buttressed and they feel like that they're not having to go it on their own because if we go at it with an emphasis on the we then there is strength that's provided not just intrinsically because of your own motivation but extrinsically because you know you have somebody who is guiding you who has your back and at the end of the day is going to be one of your biggest cheerleaders i'm a huge cheerleader massive cheerleader man i mean i sit there my thumbs are are, are are sweaty and they're shaking when i'm looking at these damn marathon trackers when i see people splits coming in you know i was a mess at the boston marathon and uh, uh what was the marathon recently with a tracker well the boston marathon the damn tracker malfunctioned right and i had people who were shooting for sub three hours in a marathon and they were on three hours and then they disappeared from the damn tracker right with two kilometers to go or five miles, I don't remember what it was. And I thought, they dropped out. They dropped out. And then I got a phone call, coach, I did it. I ran 258. And I'm sitting here throwing my phone and throwing a hissy fit, you know, because I'm at a damn Starbucks in beautiful Euless, Texas, America, trying to follow the Boston Marathon on my damn phone, you know? Right. Uh, but yeah, man, fired up, passionate, excited for people on race day, um, go in with a solid plan and knowing that they didn't have to just go it on their own the whole way. Yeah. Right. No, absolutely. And, and to touch on that, so like, what is the approach and like, what's the style of coaching and how have you kind of created your own formula? If you, obviously you don't have to, you know, you don't have to give them secret sauce, but if you could go. Oh, into, like, listen, I think that. the secret sauce is kind of out there a little bit. Here's what it is, man. My collegiate coach and he was the head coach, right? Uh, and he was my wife's coach and 
coached my wife actually to an NCAA championship when she was in college running the four by 400 meter relay at Baylor, right? And Clyde Hart always said, who's coached, oh gosh, I think that um, both Sonia Richards Ross and Michael Johnson still have the American record in the 400. He coached them both, right? And he says, listen, man, he says, these workouts, it's like baking a cake. He says, I can give somebody a recipe, but if they try to change anything, if they try to change the amount of flour, baking soda or sugar, it's not going to come out tasting right. And when it comes to my coaching, it's about 70% applied science and about 30% art. And it's the art of coaching. It's the nuance um, that you learn from just kind of being on the job. I'm not some savant. I'm just a guy that's coached a little bit and seen a little bit. And I apply all of my on-the-job training, all of my experiences. It's learned experience, right? And then all the experts and all the coaches and people that I talked about um, who I bounce ideas off of have had contributions too. And then you uh, kind of, do a little bit of field research. Listen, I was, I'm a much better coach now than I was in 2001. I coached my first high school kid in 2001, and that was 21 years ago. I don't look back on it and I think, man, you know, um, I would have had him do a little bit more tempo running. I would have stressed slowing down on the easy days. I might have stressed running more volume. Um, even when he was 16 or 17, could have done more. And so I've learned a lot. And the secret sauce is, Go at it with passion, be self-assured, but always be able to the answer the question, why? If I can't tell a runner why we're doing this workout, then I should be fired. Flat yeah. out, right? Yeah. I, better, I better be able to have an answer to the why. Now, it might not be a satisfying answer. It might not be what people want to hear, but there is a method to the madness because it's, there's no madness at all. OK, it's a very structured plan that I typically have when I'm looking at marathons. I have a pretty well formed idea, right, of how to do this. Um, and I'm tweaking things just a little bit right here and there, um, maybe adding in a little bit more speed work, uh, maybe changing the structure a little bit on one of the long run workouts three weeks before a marathon. But it's high in aerobic training. It is adhering to principles that exercise physiologist uh, um, Joe Vigil, who's basically the father of U.S. distance running, right? PhD, one of the all-time great coaches in this country, uh, who coached, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Dina Drossen, now Dina Castor for a long time, you know, and uh, was, a, you know, a, a coach at Adams State in Colorado for a long time. Um, applied science, man, critical velocity, max VO2 doing it in proper percentages, um, not getting yourself overcooked. Um, but then knowing how to tweak things, Vincent, you know, I have people call me up and they say, well, I had this bowler plate plan and it didn't work great for me. I didn't have anybody to ask questions of. I didn't have anybody who could say, hey, man, you've been sick or, hey, you had a sore Achilles tendon or, hey, you know, that workout's kind of a little bit low volume. I'm trying to do this race. Maybe you should do this. Let's tweak it this way. That's the art of coaching. And that's 30% of it, um, if I had to give you percentages. Um, but, you know, adhering to strict scientific principles on a certain level has to be the thread that runs through all of it. Abandoning physiology and science and treating it like the backseat of your car after prom, you know, if it just feels good, do it. That's not a great plan. It's not a great plan. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. And then obviously with, with how do you think, running has advanced with all the technology and obviously like, like I have a Garmin myself and I'm, you know, you kind of get all that, that data and that feedback. I'm sure that only helps you in that 30% and helps you cater towards a specific athlete. Right. And it also helps annoy me too. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Sorry. no, no. I, uh, uh, jokes aside here, here's the deal. Listen, um, the technological investment uh, investments and advancements have had a net positive effect on the running industry and on runners individually. We're able to go out and know how far we ran now because we have global positioning systems on our wrists. When used to, um, the only people that had that was the US military. I'm able now to coach somebody in Switzerland or Jerusalem or Colombia, right? Um, and I actually 
do coach people in all those places <laughs> um lithuania too and i can instantly go and i can look at pace cadence heart rate uh make sure everything looks up to snuff one of the things that's interesting that i do talk to people about is don't become so beholden to the technology that we lose our our, our ability to feel one of the quintessentially human traits that really sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom is our ability to self-assess and feel and change on the fly and uh, process tons of data, right? The problem is sometimes I find that people spend so much time staring at their garment and it says, well, it says that my heart rate is this, therefore the run was hard. And my question for them is, yeah, 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 yeah. But how did it feel? Right. Well, my heart rate said, I did not ask you that. I asked you, how did it feel? Did it feel easy? Did it feel hard? Right? So we have to be careful not to be so completely beholden to it. that, Like I told somebody the other day, did we get a damn crick in our neck because we spent so much time doing this? Like, right. it's like hey, did you notice there was a sunrise up there you could be looking at? Right. right? Yeah. Uh, but net good. It's a net good. I mean, we've got GPSs now, and then we've got advancements in technology and shoes right? Um, the carbon plate racers. Uh, Nike obviously was at the forefront of that, but we have them um, across many, many shoe manufacturers now making these marathon racers where people are running faster than they ever have. And people who bemoan that, I always tell them, well, I mean, we're not still pole vaulting with, you know, with bamboo poles. We have fiberglass poles, right? There's a reason why Mondo Duplantis broke his own world record. I think he vaulted almost 20 feet, uh, uh, three inches um, just a few days ago, right? Well, you know, fiberglass pole, right? We're not bemoaning that, right. right? It's not cheating. It's advancements in sports, right? So um, the carbon plate racers have been transformative for people. Um, garments have just made it so easy for me to coach people. I mean, literally from Lithuania to, 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 to Ecuador, to Medellin, Colombia, Mexico City, Saskatchewan, it got them all over, and right. I can instantly access anybody's garment data just as fast, no matter no matter where they live. It's yeah. really cool. It really is. The advancement's awesome. Yeah. And, and so, what do you what do you think are some key tips for people getting into running, and then some key tips for people that want to do a marathon? For people who want to run a marathon, I'll take the questions in reverse order. Do not try to rush it. Okay, pick a marathon that is several months out. Um, if you've never done run and your running volume isn't super high, that way you give yourself a chance to um, have a more enjoyable experience. Now, I always get the question, when am I gonna be ready? And I always tell them, well, you're ready to run a marathon today. And they always say, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I mean, you could complete it. You right. would survive it. I mean, there's almost a 100% chance that you could go and walk 100 meters and jog 100 meters for 26 miles and get that done. So you, right. you, you're ready today. But the question is, ready for what? Right. When they ask me, well, when am I going to be ready? My answer is, ready for what? Break the world record or finish or hit any one of the millions of points on the continuum in between. Right. Right. And so my answer is, well, let's pick a date when you can achieve running competence along the way. Then actually hit some structured workouts along the way, get our long run to where we can get a couple of 20 plus mile runs in prior to the marathon. I like three, sometimes four, but you can get it done in a couple, right? And get to the line confident and secure in the fact that you put in some solid work so that you can go out and run a competent marathon where you can run the whole way feel relatively in control, not necessarily hyper obsessing about pace because your goal might be to just finish, right? But, you know, give yourself more than 10 weeks because then you end up slogging it and it becomes drudgery. You may not like it. And then it may be a deterrent to doing it again. And I would hate that because I love the sport so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And that's and for, and for people to myself. To, yeah, exactly, exactly. And to answer your first question, people just getting into running, be patient. Don't spend a whole lot of time comparing yourself to other people because uh, those comparisons can become burdensome. I think that you could possibly get demoralized if you spend so much time looking at other people who are doing things that you deem to be impossible, right? Um, Rome was not built in a day. 
So we have to be patient. Give yourself some grace. When I say yourself, I mean the general person, right? Give yourself some grace. Understand that we're not always going to have moonbeams and rainbows shooting out of our butt. Um, it's going to be a little tough a lot of days. We're going to take it slow. Um, you take it easy on yourself. Be patient, but be consistent. If they want to, quote, cool, get into running, then actually get into running. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean go out and run a ton on one day and then not run for three days. Even if you're just running a mile, go run a mile a day. Right. Because guess what? That's consistency that then is going to make running two miles a day easier. That's then going to make running three miles a day easier. And before you know it, you're going to be doing something that resembles active training. So give yourself grace, but be consistent. And you're going to give yourself a chance for sure. Yeah. No, I think yeah. those are great tips. And I, I feel like I, I wish I, I could have heard them before I really uh, just threw myself into endurance stuff. But I'm glad, yeah. uh, glad I have your assistance now. And, and the last question I just really want to touch on, obviously, the name of the podcast is the Keep Going Podcast. What keeps you going? What keeps you driving with coaching, with family, with life in general? Like what really, what really just motivates you? The fact that I think that the world is a far more beautiful place than it is a dark place. And who makes the world beautiful? What makes the world beautiful? It is the human spirit. It is the human competitive spirit, whether it's we're competing with ourselves or competing against other people. And what drives me is watching people succeed, watching my family be happy, um, 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 doing the best job that I can and making people around me um, hopefully better, right? Not spending my life tearing down, but spending my time trying to build up. And so what keeps me going is there's always that next race. There's always that next workout. There's always that next athlete who's going to come along and say, I never thought I could do that. Thank you. And then, of course, like I told you, most of the time, I thank them right. for entrusting me to do that. But then it's so inspiring and motivating. Like, when is the next race? Like, I'm so excited right now, man. We got Berlin Marathon in September. We got Marine Corps Marathon October 30th. We got Indianapolis Marathon November 5th. New York Marathon November the 6th. We've got um, uh, uh, gosh, Baltimore Marathon, I think it's October the 16th. We've got California International Marathon in December. And on and on and on. And I mean, I, I cannot wait for this fall. I mean, I've literally got dozens of people running in some of those races. And then there's the 2023, then there's the 2024 Olympic trials. There's always the next race and there's always the next sex story, right? Yeah. I've got people who are ex-addicts who one of them could be end up being sort of a national class runner here very, very shortly, right? I've got people who have fallen on hard times and raised themselves up by their own bootstraps. Hell, I'm doing the easy work. They're doing the hard work, man. I mean, they come from nothing and they've become something man, there's a lot of inspiration out there. And I'm not the giver of the inspiration. I'm simply the one that sort of stumbles upon it. And I just think, man, this is one tough ass hombre. Or man, this is one tough young lady. That's what keeps me going, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, hearing you say it just fires me up. You know, I'm getting, getting excited for Colorado. Yeah, well, I mean, you're the guy who decided to pick a marathon to run at 5,500 feet. You know, so, challenge. I, you know, you're, you're a good looking guy, but you may not be that bright, you know, <laughs> so no, you know, you know, Boulder's fantastic because, oh my God, the weather, right. right. Um, you know, I have, a, uh, a, you know, a, a couple of athletes in that part of the country, uh, one in Boulder, you know, and, um, I, I look with no small amount of envy right now, um, at the weather there. Um, but you know, you're going to do a great job. And, you know, Boulder's only at about 5,500 feet. So it's right. not so super high, you know, and you're going to trade off some heat and some humidity um, in the late summer and early fall. Um, and I have a feeling that it's going to be a net good you know, going yeah. up to Boulder and tackling that marathon. Um, yeah, so I'm no. excited. I'm excited to see how it plays out. Absolutely. And yeah, honestly, I really, really appreciate your time coming on here and always appreciate your mindset and your insight. And I just, like you said, how you've learned from your coaches, I learned from people like you and, and your experience. And obviously, you know, you've, you've, you've seen a lot, you've done a lot and, uh, and always appreciate your wisdom. Everybody who I come in touch with uh, teaches me something, even if something just almost 
so infinitesimally small that they don't realize that they did it. And uh, the sum total of me is only as good as the parts. And all of those parts are the shared experiences I have with people who I coach and people I come in contact with. So I don't think that you realize how grateful I am for the opportunity to come on here and just blabber away. Um, if one person gets one thing out of what I said, then it was worth me, you know, wasting all this good Texas air, you know? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about, right? It's just, it's even if that's the thing is everybody wants to reach millions and millions, but it's not, I mean, you could affect one person and just change their life for the better. And that's, I think that's the most rewarding thing. And it goes back to coaching as well, where it's almost selfish in a way of you're getting a reward from helping others as well. Well, it, you know, you have ability to create your own relevance and there's no greater fate than having been said at the end of the day that you lived a life of irrelevance. Absolutely. Right? There's no worse fate. Uh, live a life of relevance and then you will live a life of fulfillment. That's Absolutely. the truth, right? I think, yeah, I think that's the perfect way to end it. And again, yeah. really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to Colorado. All right, everybody, go chase your dreams. Uh, life ain't living without dreams. Let's go. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.